procedure. No, no, I, 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 your, your division director could be inclusion too. Let's do another experiment, only I'm going to pick the site. Fine. So we do another experiment. He picks the site. We come back. Another hit. <laughs> We're ecstatic. He mumbles, it's got to be a fraud, and I think I know how you did it. You had the car bugged, and we were talking about the site on the way out there. Let me pick another site, and we're not going to talk about it in the car. We're not even, we're just going to drive to the site. I'm going to pick it at random while we're driving. Okay, fine. So we do that. It's a 30-minute experiment. 15 minutes into the experiment, he says, quick, jump in the car. We're going somewhere else. I say, well, wait, the experiment's not over. He says, yes, but you might have had somebody following me, and they've rushed back to tell them where we went, so I want to go to a second place. <laughs> Meanwhile, the poor remote viewer back in the lab is saying, gee, it's only 15 minutes into the experiment, and they're getting their car already. <laughs> anyway, describe both sites. We're ecstatic. He's sure that it's still a fraud. We, we couldn't believe what he had in mind now. He says, well, let me think about this overnight, and I'll come back tomorrow. And... I'll, 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 I'll somehow guard against what you're doing. Well, Russell and I were commiserating with each other and say, you know, nothing is going to change his mind. We've got to pull out our trump card. We've got to make him do it. If he does it, then he's got to deal with his own data. He can't blame us. Because we had done that a couple of times and we were beginning to see that people, normal people, apparently can do this. So he comes in the next day and he says, okay, I want to see another one. Uh, where's the remote viewer? And we say, well, today, you're the remote viewer. He says, what do you mean? I don't believe in this stuff. He said it much more strongly than that, i got to tell you. <laughs> we said, well, look, I mean, at least you'll see that uh, it's not harmful. We're not stressing the person out, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, he agreed to do it. So this time, I was sent off to a site by the random protocol. Russell's there. He says, OK, close your eyes. Uh, tell me what you see with regard to where Hal is. He says, okay, my eyes are closed. It's dark. I see the back of my eyelids. He says, well, I mean, let's face it, this is a mental thing. You have to use your imagination. He says, I've got a great imagination. I see him at a, at a bridge over a stream. That's just my imagination. So I come back from the bridge over the stream target. <laughs> we take him out there. He's absolutely flabbergasted. We're ecstatic, of course, again. <laughs> We're driving back and say, OK, well, we nailed it this time. And he says, it's a trick, and I know how you did it. <laughs> and we say, well, now, wait a minute. You did it. We didn't do anything. He says, let's do another experiment, and I'm going to foil your trick. All right. How do you want to do it? I don't want any interviewer with me. OK. So I put him in the experiment room. Taped the door shut because he didn't trust him anymore and he trusted us. <laughs> Sent out to a site. We come back, take the, take, take the tape off the door, open the door. He's sitting crouched in the corner of the room with his hands over his ears. And he's made a little drawing. It turns out, by the way, he really nailed the site. <laughs> and we say, okay, well, what's this thing about sitting in the corner and why didn't you want an interview? It's better with an interviewer. And he said, well, I had two hypotheses. My first hypothesis was that the interviewer, who of course knew the site, would use subtle shifts in body language that uh, sort of guide me into what to put down. So that's why I didn't want an interviewer. My other idea was that the chair you had me sitting in had speakers in the cushions that were subliminally whispering a description <laughs> of the site to me. And that's how I was getting it. So that's why I sat in the corner. <laughs> so he said, well, OK, well, you see, that's, that's not it. We're ecstatic. He's mumbling. It's a trick, and I just figured out how you did it. <laughs> hey, all right. He said, let's do another experiment. This is what I want you to do. You go to the site. While you're at your site, you take pictures. You make tape recordings. You do all that. And when you come back, you show me that stuff before I then show you what I drew. He said, okay. This is the result of that experiment. 
This has got the sort of pie-shaped sections which show up here, uh, arches and so on. Uh, he turned it into cu cupola. He didn't actually recognize it as a playground device. But he had to admit that there were definitely correlations. And we said, well, what was this thing about us taking pictures and so on? He said, I finally figured out the only thing left was that when you left, you didn't go anywhere. You just sat in the lobby. You would come back and see what I had drawn and then take me to a site that looked like that. Okay, well. Now, about this time we had, uh, by the way, he went back. He, he was convinced now. <clears throat> As you'll see later on, he became one of our great all-time remote viewers. Anyway, we had another problem about this time. <clears throat> you have to realize that the only thing secret about this program was that it was secret mm -hmm. and who we were doing it for. But, you know, we had volunteers come in and try out experiments, and they'd go out and they would talk to people. I mean, my own, my, one of my own personal problems was the intelligence people were scouring the neighborhood, uh, asking if I ran around, if I drank a lot, and all this kind of thing to get my next level of clearance. And so all my neighbors were coming to me and saying, was that a secret project? All these people have been on? <laughs> well, the only thing that was secret was it was secret. So about this time, people were beginning to speculate. So we really pressed on our sponsor at CIA and said, look, you, you've got to let us publish something. You know, we've done a lot of experiments here. We could publish something. Um, otherwise, people are going to keep uh, this whisper campaign that's some secret project. But if we publish something in the open literature, that will dampen that down. So they finally agreed we could do that. So we decided to write up some experiments we had done and publish them in a journal where both my colleague Russell Targ and I had published many times, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Proceedings. We both published papers on vacuum tubes and lasers and microwave tubes and so on. So we sent the, uh, the uh, manuscript off. It went to Bob Lucky, at, uh, who was Director of Communications at Bell Labs. He was the editor. He comes back and says, you know, I don't know what to do. I said, why? Are, are, is everybody trashing the manuscript? He said, no, actually, almost everybody thinks it should be published. I said, well, what's your problem? Well, one really heavy hitter, very leading light in, in the engineering industry, simply wrote, this is the kind of thing I wouldn't believe in even if it were true. <laughs> so I don't know what to do. I'm afraid that the engineers will go up and smoke if I publish this paper. And I say, okay, well, how about this? Let us come to Bell Labs. We'll present it to your engineering staff. If they don't throw tomatoes, publish it. If they do, don't. So, okay, well, that's fair. So we went to Bell Labs. We made a big presentation. They loved it. Everyone was trying to figure out how it could possibly be in engineering terms. So we thought that sort of sewed it up. And uh, again, uh, he got cold feet. And so, once again, we pull out our trump card. We say, okay, why don't you do some experiments here in Bell Labs? If your experiments work, publish it. He did them. They worked. And we published. But, of course, there's a story that goes along with everything. This journal, this engineering journal, is routinely published, uh, translated, and published in Russia. So Russians uh, came back on this particular journal issue and said, uh, by the way, we're going to leave out that paper on uh, ESP stuff. And uh, fortunately, the proceedings of the IEEE editors said, well, no, no, it's, you take the whole journal issue or nothing. And he said, OK, uh, well, we want to at least leave out the references to the Russian work. That's what they're really afraid of, that their own countrymen would realize they were doing research in this area. But they, the, the IEEE, they, they, they held their ground, said, nope, you got to publish the whole thing. Their next ploy was, well, um, there are a lot of terms here. This is a new field. Can we at least send some questions for the authors to answer to help us do a good job in our translation? So we all agreed to that. So in comes a document about that thick, <laughs> asking everything about you know, who's funding it, uh, what results we're getting, blah, 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 blah. So we all knew it had to come from the KGB. So we just threw it in the trash, and they finally gave in and published it anyway. Years later, a defector from, the, from uh, Russia came over and, and, and approached us and said, you remember that big document you got? 
I was the one that wrote the document for the KGB. <laughs> When we did the experiments, published them in the IEEE, uh, we had several series. If you ever go back and read the paper now, it's 1976 proceedings. Whenever you see visitor one, visitor two, visitor three, that was our euphemism at the time for CIA agent. <laughs> You'll see that even a series that they uh, participated in turned out to be independently statistically significant. About this time, the higher-ups at CIA were getting worried, even though some, even though Fraudbuster came out and gave us a good uh, bill. Uh, he said, "How do I know the CIA people aren't colluding with the researchers who are colluding with the subjects?" So one of the CIA oversight people went to a different part of the agency and said, "Pick out a target. Don't tell me what it is." because good results come out of this, I want it known that me being a monitor in the program was not involved in colluding with the researchers and subjects. So his friend uh, at the CIA gave him um, the coordinates of a vacation cabin he had actually in West Virginia. <coughs> and so uh, we had two remote viewers, Ingo Swan and Pat Price. Ingo. Uh, Started to look at the place. Says, "Well, I don't see much here. You know, I see some woods. I see, you know, some cabins." What the guy didn't realize, who had picked the site, was that right over the crest was a super secret NSA facility. <laughs> Ingo said, "Well, well, right over there, something looks really interesting. It looks very military. Maybe that's what they want me to see." So he gives <laughs> all of that. Uh, which turned out to match quite well. We then targeted Pat Price on it. Price was a very adventurous kind of guy. And so when he got there, I mean, he describes it like he's traveling. Uh, he decided to wander around through the facility reading name tags. Sticking his head into a safe and a bunch of words popped up into his mind. And so we wrote them all down, passed them on. Pretty soon the entire intelligence apparatus of the country, law enforcement apparatus, ended up on our doorstep. How'd you get this information? <laughs> oh, we're just doing some ESP experiments. Go <laughs> name me that. Who leaked you this information? It turned out that, in fact, it was very accurate. The write-up of the experiment uh, included this statement. Pat Price, who had no military intelligence background, provided a list of project titles associated with current and past activities, including one of extreme sensitivity. Also, the code name of the site was provided. They did a five-year investigation, <laughs> couldn't find any reason for the leak, but what really saved us, because suspicion was always going to be there, was that, as you can imagine, this got briefed right up the chain. It got up to John McMahon, who eventually became uh, deputy director of CIA at the time. He was a division director. And he said, well, don't waste it on our sites. Try a Soviet site and see what happens. <laughs> if we get good data on the Soviet site, I don't care if it's leaked or what. So we targeted Pat Price on a Soviet site. All we gave him was coordinates of the site, and he laid out some buildings and roads and that kind of thing. And then he drew this crane. When he drew the crane, he said, I'm lying on my back on the top of a two-story building, and this humongous crane is rolling over. It's so big that a man would be half a wheel height. And that's what I'm getting. Now, I have to say, I was embarrassed. I knew the two CIA guys were sitting in the motel waiting to see the data. To me, this was science fiction. couldn't possibly be. So I went over. I said, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but he's come up with this science fiction crane that's bigger than, got to be bigger than any crane in the world. There's the site. There's the crane. There's a the man. I guess that's the building. And they were really impressed. So they came over, they introduced themselves, and then had him spend a week wandering around for the, through the facility describing everything that he could find. Just to give an example, here you can see them all for comparison. 
to give an example of the kind of data he got, he said there are 